12 tribes, not your typical deli owners. I first came across this cult when my oldest and dearest brother got stuck at one of their delis for Thanksgiving. The family he was supposed to be having Thanksgiving with, one of them caught COVID, and so that was canceled. So they just ended up at a deli. Like his wife, his son, my nephew, just the cutest kid in the world. They all ended up at one of these yellow delis that 12 Tribes has. And he texts the group chat like, guys, I think I'm being recruited into a cult. So of course, because we love our older brother, we roasted him which is how you show love. (laughs) Thanksgiving is a family holiday after all. It is about familial love. So after I heard about this, I decided to take a closer look. Who are the 12 tribes? What are these delis? And how is the food? The history of this cult. 12 Tribes was founded as the Vine Christian Community Center in Chattanooga, Tennessee. This was the early 1970s. The founder is called Albert Eugene Spriggs Jr. and he founded it with his fourth wife, Marcia Spriggs. Now this started as a teen Christian community group and they started this in their home and they called it the Light Brigade. In order to minister full time, Spriggs quit his job and started a restaurant called the Yellow Deli. Now, 12 Tribes comes out of the Jesus movement of the late 1960s, early 1970s. The Spriggs had actually just come from California, even though Eugene Spriggs was a Tennessee native. The 60s, they were a time of great religious awakening, (laughs) to say the least, especially in California. People everywhere, they were searching for answers. Many people turned to Jesus, but few stuck with it at least not to this degree. And the Spriggs and 12 tribes actually did. Now, the members in the early 70s, they tried to join various churches in the Chattanooga area, but they did not approve of the way the churches were being operated. Now, according to the Wikipedia, which we'll get to later, but the first Presbyterian church didn't approve of the group's welcoming of all races. Now, this is kind of ironic because if you look deep into them, you'll see that they have been accused, 12 tribes has been accused of racism by former members. Nevertheless, in the early 1970s, this caused friction with the Chattanooga community. This prompted this group to start the Vine Christian Community Church. Now, 12 Tribes wants to recreate the Christian church of the early first century AD, immediately after the death of Jesus Christ. Um, This is described in the book of Acts. We see all of the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. 12 Tribes calls Jesus Yahshua, which is his Hebrew name. They believe you must hate your old life and seek life in service of the church or in service of Yahshua. They live communally, and if they're in cities, they all share one big house or houses. Members give up all of their money to the church, just like Jesus commanded his followers to do. Uh, They work for their businesses as well. So the people working in the yellow delis, they're all members of the church. Even though they're not necessarily paid by the deli, their living expenses are covered if they follow the agreed upon rules. They follow many of the Old Testament codes. They take Hebrew names and they dress in these kind of old timey clothes. Women are meant to obey their husbands. Children have to obey everyone. And if they don't, they get the switch. We'll go into this later under their practices and beliefs, but children definitely get the switch in 12 tribes. Anyway. 12 Tribes believes in proselytizing to spread the word about their message. Now, in the 1970s, they started in Chattanooga, but they set up shop in Vermont in a place called Island Pond, and they call this the Northeast Kingdom Community Church. When relations with the local people in Tennessee became more stressed, 12 Tribes became more withdrawn. They left the churches, as I was talking about, and they began baptizing their own people, which upset local churches even more. The community, the Chattanooga community, labeled the 12 tribes a cult, and outsiders began a campaign of deprogramming of the members. This was part of the cult scare of the mid to late 1970s. You got to think, was it really a scare or was it a reasonable reaction to the many destructive new religious movements that were out there? Remember, we had the Manson family and later there was Jonestown. Now, 12 tribes, uh, then still the Vine Christian Community Church, ignored all the negative press in the area and they kept doing what they were doing. They set up a second Yellow Deli as well as the Areopagus Cafe. Areopagus? 
See, what sets 12 tribes apart from most churches and most religious movements is that they have functional businesses that they can focus their energies around. They've got farms, they've got bakeries, they've got construction companies, and most visibly, they have the yellow delis. Now, apparently, the food is very good. It's fresh, uh, mostly grown on their own farm. They're open Sundays noon until Fridays at noon, so it's kind of 24-5, and they have many locations across the world now. This all started in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Now, in 1980, the relations with the town of Chattanooga between Chattanooga and 12 tribes completely soured. They left their church, their settlement in Chattanooga, and they headed for their settlement in Vermont. This happened after a local police detective kidnapped his daughter to have her deprogrammed. He had her arrested on these trumped up charges so he could unbrainwash her. Now, a judge threw those charges out completely. People people. Take careful note. I know it's tempting, but you cannot legally kidnap family members who have joined a cult. You just can't do it. It's kidnapping. Now, this happened again in 2015 with 12 tribes, and I cannot imagine the pain that these family members are going through. It must be really hard to watch your loved one go down one of these paths. My first instinct (laughs) would also be to kidnap my family too, but you just can't do it. Legally, you cannot do it. The United States has religious freedom, and unless there's abuse that you can prove, you cannot kidnap your family members. Now, this might be the only situation where I'm kind of on the side of the kidnappers. I can just imagine if my brother had moved his family into one of these communities. I'd probably kidnap him, his wife, and his son, try to deprogram them, but that would be illegal. So we cannot do that. No kidnapping. No kidnapping. Now, we remember that Jonestown was now we remember that Jonestown was in 1978. Jim Jones led his 900 plus followers to their death just to protect his fragile ego. So people were really on edge at this point. They were scared that other cults might follow suit. And many years later, Heaven's Gate actually did. So it's not as if their fears were unfounded. Also, even if a cult doesn't commit mass suicide, the members often sabotage their own lives for the cult so that when they do get out of the cult, they're in a much worse position than they were going in. Regardless, the people of Chattanooga were not having anything that the 12 tribes was selling. So the group moved to Vermont. Now in Vermont, they also set up businesses. Um, The Tennessee businesses actually had to close because at this point, the group had gotten themselves into some kind of debt. They had to free themselves of that. So they set up new businesses in Vermont. Now, they initially got on really well with the people of Vermont, with the locals, because they ran an honest business or businesses, uh, which is what New Englanders really care about. (laughs) As a New Englander, I can attest to this. You know, when my brother initially said, hey, I'm at this cult deli, we were on the group chat like, but what's the menu like, though? And he sent us a picture of the menu. And it seems as though it's actually good American diner food and the prices were reasonable. All I'm going to say is I get it. The people of Vermont didn't care as long as they don't bother them. I get it. However, the Citizens Freedom Foundation along with former members, made these child abuse allegations against 12 tribes, now the Northeast Kingdom Community Church. Now, these allegations came out in 1983, and this got the community raided in 1984. Children were taken away. Now, the child abuse is where 12 tribes really runs into legal troubles. They homeschool their kids so that the kids can work on their property, and they believe strongly in spare the rod, spoil the child. They whip their kids with this rod, which is more like a stick. They start at a very early age, too. Uh, Look, the government will let adults ruin their lives. You can do whatever you want as an adult, but once you involve kids, this is when the government really starts to step in. Now, this child abuse was a major scandal. It made the papers, it made the papers nationally, and it really upset the community. Now, the charges did end up being dropped after witnesses recanted, and the court didn't have a legal reason to hold them. The children were returned to their families. This return of the children is known in the 12 tribes as the Day of Deliverance. Now, look, I know a lot of you are like, well, kids today are too spoiled. They need more discipline and they need to do some more real world work. I get that. It's a valid criticism of modern children. But in my opinion, 12 Tribes takes it just a bit too far. A&E with Elizabeth Vargas did a story with this former member called Sammy Brousseau. 
And she said that she was completely unprepared for the real world after living her entire life in 12 tribes. She was born into it. So parents, whatever you want to do for yourself is one thing. You know, the government allows it. But you just have to leave your kids out of it. Because think of it. Children of Catholic parents don't have to be Catholic if they don't want to. What makes you think that your children are going to want to follow some sort of obscure communal cult in which women are not seen as equals? Like, this is very fringe, and to force it on your children is just not fair, especially the daughters. Now, we all believe in respecting our parents, but this, this is a little bit too much to ask. Okay, back to the scene. Over the 1980s and 1990s, 12 tribes expanded to different cities and countries, including Canada, Australia, Argentina, Brazil, Spain, Germany, and the UK. They actually had to leave Germany because Germany does not play with child abuse. They do not mess around with that. They don't let you homeschool your children. They don't play with child labor. In 2013, Germany seized 40 children and the European Court of Human Rights actually upheld the ruling. So 12 tribes in Germany actually had to move to the Czech Republic because Germany doesn't tolerate corporal punishment at all. So you cannot whoop a kid in Germany. And we know that 12 tribes believes strongly in whoopings and it just doesn't fly in Germany. 12 tribes will go as far as to spank a baby still in diapers. And Germany's just like, absolutely not. You can't do that here. Hit the road, hit the road, <laughs> get out of here. Back to US operations. 12 tribes actually did return to Chattanooga, Tennessee in 2005, where they set up a deli by the university campus. Now, wherever 12 tribes goes, they set up businesses because they're very enterprising and industrious people. They actually work very hard. These businesses, they give them a good reputation in the communities. And the delis in particular, they offer a new place to recruit new members. Very good, 12 tribes. Very good. Now, in 2021, founder Eugene Spriggs died at the Hiddenite North Carolina community. And some say there will be trouble filling Spriggs' shoes because he was just such a good leader. Now, although Spriggs never called himself the Messiah or even the leader, he did lead them with much success. Although the Denver Post claims that Marsha may have been the brains behind the operation, we'll revisit that theory and its implications shortly. Now, succession will be difficult. However, it's not impossible, as we've seen from Scientology. If you look up 12 tribes, your opinion on them will vary greatly depending on what source you get to first. A note on the 12 tribes Wikipedia page, it portrays them in the best possible light. I don't know who wrote it, uh, but upon reading it, I read it at first and I was like, well, these seem like good guys. They don't sound so bad at all. Well, just wait for it. If you happen to find the A&E special first, you'll think that this is a straight up cult or anything from a current affairs Australia who has been on their case. You'll think that these people are monsters. Also, 12 tribes themselves are actively putting out a good message over video and their website. And they put this messages about their actions, their lifestyle and their beliefs. So if you find that, you're like, oh, these are good people. You know, you go to YouTube, you find one of these and you're like, oh, these, are, these people are pretty cool. You know, plus they have delis where people can meet them in person and they give a very good impression. However, keep looking and you'll see the authorities think that they are scandalous. However, these authorities cannot get them on anything solid. The FBI file on them is downright salacious. It is salacious. It accuses them of drugging members with hallucinogens, of having orgies, of gangbangs as punishment for disobedient wives. Like, what? However, the FBI hasn't filed charges and they cannot prove these accusations, at least in court. Certainly, these actions would be against the professed beliefs of 12 tribes, as they have put it on their website. Also, most of that stuff that I just listed is actually not illegal. I know some of y'all went to look of how you can get on these drug-induced orgies, but no, close that Google tab. It's definitely not worth it. And there is no guarantee you'll get a drug-induced orgy if you do join. It's just not worth it. You get a sandwich. Be happy for a sandwich. And just because the FBI says something doesn't mean that it's true. If you've learned nothing else from my videos, <laughs> you should know that one by now. Accusations against 12 tribes have not been proven in American courts. The court of public opinion is not an actual courtroom. I don't care what anyone tells you. 
Now, the FBI and the feds aren't going to look at them as closely as, say, the Branch Davidians, because 12 tribes actually avoids guns in military training. They have good relationships with their neighbors, and their businesses are honest. They're legally a 501D, so they can conduct business the way that they do. Now, aside from the kids, 12 tribes is protected under the First Amendment, which gives us freedom of religion. That's what we all chose or what our family members chose when they decided to emigrate here or they decided to stay here. So they're protected. It might make some people very upset, like the Martinez family, who actually tried to kidnap and deprogram their son in 2015. I said, I get it. I totally get it. Nevertheless, we are a country of laws and... They're protected in this way? Okay, so now that you know the basics about 12 tribes, how do they stack up against other cults? Okay, rate my cult, 12 tribes. I know, to cult followers, whatever group I'm talking about is the true word of God. But we here at Maya Muses do this about once a month, hopefully, and they all start to look alike after a while. So how does 12 tribes really stack up? I bet they think they're the real deal. I bet if you're a 12 tribes member watching this, you're like, no, we're the real thing. Everything else is fake. Everyone else is fake, but we're the real thing. To me, that's like believing in Santa Claus, but mocking the tooth fairy. Like they're really, they all kind of fit the same pattern, huh? Anyway, we're gonna go through some of the important criteria to see how 12 tribes ranks. Number one, customs and beliefs. Now, 12 tribes tries to mimic the first century church as described in the book of Acts. They keep many of the old Hebrew rules, including changing their names to Hebrew names. Remember, we talked about the name changes before. We've talked about this many times before because this is actually quite common. Changing the name strips you of your old identity and lets you build a new identity with a new name within the group. 12 tribes follows Jesus, but they call him Yahshua, Yahshua. They dress in Hebrew clothes, but you wouldn't really mistake them for Orthodox Jews. Um, you know, old timey, traditional, something like you would see on Little House on the Prairie. Now, we stand Little House on the Prairie. <laughs> of course we do. I'm just saying, that's how they look. They don't necessarily look like Orthodox Jews. They believe that women should obey their husbands and husbands should obey the law and their community elders. Now this comes off as sexist to modern sensibilities, but it is not strange. Nearly every Abrahamic tradition everywhere went by this gender philosophy until relatively recently. Maybe our parents or grandparents' generation actually started to break from it. Now, if this is what you believe, fine, but you're not gonna be colonizing space or mining asteroids with this kind of philosophy. It's old timey, as I said. Now we've seen this wives must obey their husband thing. We've seen it a lot online recently with the trad movement and it doesn't hold up to the demands of the modern world. It just doesn't. And that's okay because 12 tribes is modern world adjacent, but not so forward looking. Think Amish with Hebrew names. There you go. Oh, and websites. They believe strongly in community. They all live close together, especially their branches that are in cities. The branches that live in cities all live in one house where married couples share a room while single people, they share bedrooms sex segregated bedrooms. So that's how they split it up when they're in cities. They believe that Jesus will come again and that there have to be 12 tribes of 144,000 righteous people on earth to welcome him. This comes from the book of Revelation. They aim to breed this generation by intermarrying members and raising righteous children. Now to do that, 12 tribes employs corporal punishment. Children get whoopings with a balloon stick, which is kind of like a switch, and they get whipped while they're still in diapers. Like, come on, it's a little early for that, huh? There is a great A&E testimony by Sammy Brossow. I'll actually link it at the bottom. And she tells about how she found out that her parents <laughs> were kind of full of shit. A young boy accused her of sabotaging her father's guitar and she was beaten and she was put in a room where she was basically grounded. She was put on punishment and the adults came in and they told her that God had told them that she did it and she saw through it immediately. She was seven. She's like, oh, this is all bullshit. So I think Sammy Brassau is like the real life hero of this. She was homeschooled and she was constantly bombarded by group brainwashing, but something clicked for her at age seven and she never forgot about it. It's really amazing when you think about it that somebody born into a cult is able to see through the brainwashing without any outside influence, just on her own. She was like, it's nonsense. It's really an amazing young woman. And I don't know how young she is anymore, but she's an amazing woman. Now she works to rehabilitate others who have left 12 tribes. 
Now, according to the Denver Post, many of the first generation children born into the group have left, some alone, some with their families. Sammy Brousseau is alienated from her family. This former member left with his. But look, I'm going to be honest. A lot of groups are cruel to apostates. Apostates are people who turn against their religion as opposed to non-believers. Like non-believers never converted to begin with. And it's really not unusual for groups to be cruel to apostates, especially apostate young women, because women take a lot of resources to raise and they tend to be more valuable on the dating market. They can make more of your tribe. So lucky young women. Now, single 12 tribe men are actually rewarded with a wife by the community. Nobody gets rewarded with a husband ever. Imagine someone tries to reward you with a husband, like some random ass dude. You're like, no, ew. Like, no, but Jedediah hath planted 10 acres. Damn girl, what do you want in a man? I'm sorry, I do not want to be rewarded with a husband. Someone should write a dissertation on why <laughs> you can be rewarded with a wife and not a husband. Anyway, I get why 12 Tribes are so protective of its young women, but as a young woman, I very much admire Sammy Brasso for taking action for herself, because it's really amazing when you think about it. Former member Sinasta Colucci details how the tribe strictly controls sex among members, including male masturbation and assigning wives. Now, 12 Tribes believes that worldly aims are shallow. In this documentary from 12 Tribes England, they describe the grind of the modern world. They describe it a lot like samsara, kind of like this never-ending cycle of shallow nonsense. Point taken. Touche. <laughs> samsara is a Buddhist concept, and it basically says the world is just bullshit repeating and enlightenment will save us in the case of 12 tribes they believe that love will save us now we here at my amuses also describe the modern world as a never-ending cycle of bullshit never-ending cycle of nonsense <laughs> and our solution is to laugh about it not to change our names or abandon our parents or beat our children because that's a bit extreme i mean you took it too far right anyway so these people were disillusioned with the modern world and 12 tribes offered them salvation through love what is love to them? For them, love is sacrifice, sacrifice to the community. Love is active. They are not always happy with one another. They're not always happy with one another, but according to them, they take actions to put aside those hard feelings and to humble themselves. However, however, according to the FBI, one woman was punished for being unfaithful to her husband by being gangbanged. Maybe don't give away brides to a man who can till the most fields and you won't get a wife that's so unfaithful. Also, what kind of pervert thinks up a gangbang as a punishment? Ugh, you knew dude was just waiting for an excuse. The misogyny is off the charts here. Now, is this true? If it's true, is it common practice to all communities or is this an isolated incident? If it is true and it is common, it's not the humility that most of us had in mind. Also, the FBI report includes physical abuse of adults. And like we said before, we got to take everything the FBI says with a grain of salt. Let's give everybody the benefit of the doubt here. In 12 Tribes video and literature, members say that they love the community and that love from the community is unconditional. This woman in the documentary called Basmat, she says she joined for love, that she didn't initially believe the teachings, but if she needed to believe to get that love, she would. But I also had no doubts that they were going to show me they were going to show me the way to be different. Somehow the love that they showed to me, it, it won my trust. And then I start asking, you know, what is it? And what's this that you believe? And they told me a few things and they talk about, talked about God. And at first that was a bit off-putting because I didn't believe in God. But, but the, the life that they had backed up the words they were saying. And I came to a point where I said, I, I believe anything you say fatherless behavior absolutely fatherless behavior <laughs> my god but hey she's happy what are we gonna do they believe in giving up all of their worldly possessions to join the group and love is a many splendored thing they describe the story of barnabas in the bible who gave up his fortune to his fellow disciples of jesus now we're not going to really comment on barnabas <laughs> whether he was foolish or not but i will say give up everything here so that you can get a reward in heaven can neither be proven nor disproven and for this reason i ask you to send all of your money to my cash app and i will give you a unicorn to ride in heaven now i think you swear this 
But if you don't send me all of your money, you will be walking in hell. The choice is yours. Now, 12 Tribes believes you must hate your life on earth to follow Yahshua, Jesus. Many of the people who join tell stories of hating the modern world, of its shallow material nature. Fair enough. However, they think that the solution to this is giving up their life, their work, and their families to 12 tribes. There is one very interesting belief on the website. They believe that they and their descendants will colonize the stars. We're getting shades of Mormon here, so that is interesting. They believe in the necessity of a civil government, which allows the separation of church and state, so that their movement is allowed to exist and flourish. Now, the United States has such a civil government, and they seem to revere Roger Williams. Now, fellow Rhode Islanders know Roger Williams as one of the greatest badasses there ever was. He left Massachusetts, a bunch of mass holes, because the Puritan government was a bunch of posers, and they still listened to the Church of England, despite fleeing from the Church of England, so it's totally right. Roger Williams founded Providence Plantations, and as we know it, Rhode Island, basically. And he founded that by respecting the natives. Also, Rhode Island was the first colony charter to guarantee the separation of church and state because Roger Williams really didn't think it was right to force someone to go to church if they didn't believe. He was right about that. <laughs> Massachusetts forced you to go to church. Anyway, funny thing about the Roger Williams publication is that they point out that Roger Williams did not believe in Christian baptism because he believed only the original church with the apostles of Christ could baptize somebody. Of course, 12 tribes takes this to mean that no other Christian church can baptize people, but they can baptize people because they're the original church or they're in the image of the original church. Convenient. Now, 12 tribes believes that people can be separated into three groups. We've got the righteous, which are 12 tribes members, of course. And then the moral non-believers. These are good people who have not converted to 12 tribes. And then the immoral non-believers. So that when Jesus or Yeshua returns, the righteous will rule by his side for 1,000 years. They obviously get to go to heaven. Then, after that, the moral non-believers will be taken out of stasis, woken up, and then they will be judged. They will be judged according to their conscience. And they get to go to heaven, but they don't get to have that thousand-year VIP treatment with Jesus, so you don't want to be in that group either. And the immoral non-believers, the third group, will be judged and thrown into the fiery pits of hell. Now, one thing I found very interesting about the 12 tribes' beliefs is this kind of Gnostic nature to it. Now, the early church was quite Gnostic. Now, Gnosticism is the great rebellion in Christianity. It posits that religious experiences should be felt, hence the gnosis, the knowing in Greek. But also, and this is what's applicable to 12 tribes, is that Gnostics believe that the ruler of this world, this mortal world, is wicked. Gnostics call the god of the material world the demiurge. And 12 tribes doesn't really use that term, but many of their publications make mention of an evil ruler of this world. The logic behind this is that God is all good, and so he wouldn't let his followers suffer so much, right? So who, whoever is in charge here must be a real jerk if people are suffering, right? This is not an uncommon belief among Christians or anyone else. And it kind of makes a lot of sense when you look around the world and you're like, Where's the God? <laughs> Where is he at? Well, they believe that the end of the world is coming soon. They believe it because the Bible says so. It's called the fall of man. Now, the Bible was written 1700 to 2000 years ago, and the fall hasn't happened yet. Maybe 536. Anyway, we should be so lucky as to live through the fall. Okay, we have to put up with it as is. Just look around. We got to put up with all of this. And so do our children and our children's children and their children too. So you're not going to be so lucky as to get to see the fall. At every point throughout history, someone has said, hey, we're going to see the fall. And they never did. They just looked dumb. In the 12 Tribes documentary coming out of England that I mentioned before, this one member called Hot Derek mentions the signs of the end, including peak oil, global warming, and the wars. And this was from a few years ago. He wasn't even up to date on the coming AI apocalypse yet. So see, there's always going to be a looming threat on the horizon. In Jesus's day, it was one thing. Now it's the AI and all these stupid scientists making viruses in a lab. Now, despite all of God and man's best efforts, we are still here. Get used to it. 
Now, beneath the surface, beneath all that stuff I just mentioned, 12 Tribes is actually racist and homophobic. They believe that blacks are subservient or should be subservient to whites because of the curse of Ham. Now, we here at My Muses call it horse. The curse of Ham comes from the idea that the people descended from Noah's son Ham are cursed because Ham looked upon his father's nakedness many, many thousands of years ago. This poor man has lost his daughter to this allegedly racist cult. The whole idea of the curse of Ham is toxic and we go into it on my Patreon this week. We've been all over the curse of Ham before. It's just goofy race baiting nonsense. It's got no place in the modern world or in any kind of critical mind. Slave traders used to use it to justify African slavery and you know what justified African slavery? Guns and cash. Slavery is about power, not this biblical scripture, not really even about race. It's about guns and having power over other people. And don't let some sweet talking reverend tell you otherwise. But don't fret, don't fret black people. If you were baptized into the 12 tribes, you can be redeemed. So convenient. Now these are the racist teachings that they don't really tell you until you're already committed to the church, when it would be much more difficult to leave because you've already given up all your possessions and countless hours of work. So they don't tell you until you're already in. Hmm. Convenient. They also believe that homosexuality is a sin. They condemn it in their publications. And Spriggs believed that homosexuals should be put to death, like they do in the Middle East. They should be put to death. This is from a 1990 publication from Island Pond, Vermont. It is the official position of Maya Muses that we are all awful and you shouldn't get credit for who you get off with, whether it be a man, a woman, or whatever piece of produce will have you. However, their philosophy on homosexuality is not unique, especially for 1990. Now, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center, they also have former homosexuals as part of their communities. Former homosexuals. Yeah. So overall, great beliefs. It's very first century throwback, and it's really hard to condemn 12 tribes teachings without also condemning the early Christian church. Well played, 12 tribes. Well played. Now, of course, the first century church won't have the modern American racism, which is embedded in 12 tribes. That part is giving shades of antebellum South, very Scarlet O'Hara, very chic. <laughs> so top marks for bastardizing two periods of history and shoehorning them into the modern world, a modern world that's moved past both of those things. Well done, well done. Top marks for customs and beliefs. Okay, practices and rituals. Hard work seems to be 12 tribes' primary practice. This is a great means to bring people together and to build something, to build something real. Also, people who work really hard have less downtime to think about their situation. Huh? Members work together on farms, growing as much food as they can to serve themselves and their establishments. Members move around a lot from one community to the other. In this interview with Mike the Neanderthal, this member, his name is Chenek, his Hebrew name is Chenek, describes how he has lived on four different communities in 16 years. Now, Chenek remains a member at the time of the interview. He is at the Yellow Delhi Hostel in Rutland, Vermont. And this is interesting because it indicates that the member loyalty is to 12 tribes as an organization and not necessarily to the individuals around you because they'll just move you to a different community. 12 Tribes maintains many businesses. Most notable are the Yellow Delis. These are a great recruiting tool for new members. Being a black person and didn't have the, the friendliest relationships with, with white people, that was a little bit of the background. So they go into the, to the deli and most of the staffing were, were white people, but they, they seem to not notice that my wife's parents were, were black. They just, they just loved them. And, what he was telling me is that he really experienced that love, the love of God, real love, breaks down barriers and binds people together. They're often operated near university campuses, such as the one in Chattanooga. Now, college students are young and impressionable and still forming their identity. They're easy targets for cults and for social movements and for pimps. That age range is, is also perfect for recruiting for the military. Basically, get them young and get them vulnerable. Don't, you don't do that, but this is what the cults do. Please don't you do that. <laughs> They run a hostel, which is donation based, and there they welcome hikers. Uh, they welcome them with compassion on hospitality. So you really do kill more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. And this is often called love bombing, but it's just common sense. 
you could make the argument that their love bombing never ends. They're always love bombing. It's just that the definition of love evolves from one form to the other. So hmm. now their marriage ceremony symbolically recreates or pre-creates, pre-creates God's marriage to Israel, to the people of Israel. God married Israel back in the day, just as when Jesus returns, date unknown, he will marry his righteous tribe. Their publication, Love is a Many Splendored Thing, it jumps back and forth between romantic love and biblical love. Now, this is not unique to them. It's biblical. The harlot in the book of Revelation is not a literal harlot. The loose woman symbolizes a world gone astray. But for 12 tribes, the chaste woman symbolizes a chaste society. Now, as I mentioned before, wives are told to obey their husbands, and their husbands obey their elders in Yahshua. And marriage is kind of a microcosm of the greater world for them. It is for many of us too. It's not just for them, but for many of us, marriage is a microcosm of the greater world. Because marriage is sort of this political union, and it has been that way for centuries. You know, people marry others who hold their values and who will raise children reared in that same value system. Twelve Tribes is just more open about it and more understanding of what it implies. Now, how do people get married? Now, according to former members, the elders decide who is a good fit. Hardworking young men are rewarded with a wife, making 12 tribes an incel paradise. Divorce is not allowed in 12 tribes, according to this work. Love is a many splendored thing. However, however, the marriage of founder Eugene Spriggs to Marcia is his fourth marriage, so... So there's that. Now, one of their practices seems to be love. Love for them is an action. They're not Buddhists just sitting around in enlightenment. Love is something that you do, rules that you follow, work you do for the community, sacrifice for an ideology. They are building a new society that will be ready to greet Yahshua when he returns. Now, some of you think that that is nuts, but I appreciate people with a hobby, idle hands, the devil's plaything. Sacrifice, building a new society. I mean, why not? What else do you have going on? You might as well. At least they might as well. That's what they're doing. Now, this demand for service in exchange for salvation is an old debate. Critics such as Bob Pardon, he's executive director of the Christian countercult movement, New England Institute of Religious Researches. He accuses 12 tribes of the Galatian heresy. And that basically states that 12 tribes values action over faith. And practically speaking, action pays the bills, doesn't it? That's how this yellow deli hustle works. However, in the Bible, Paul says that even if you do acts and follow all of these rules, you cannot come to Christ except through faith. Twelve tribes, according to some of their literature, also believes in faith, maybe not faith alone. This might seem very in the weeds kind of Christian stuff, but according to their lore, it matters. According to Christian lore, this matters, okay? Twelve Tribes holds bar and bat mitzvahs to celebrate youth growing into adulthood. They also perform these Israeli folk dances. Now, Jews in the audience, don't go running to join them. They also believe that the Jews killed Christ. Now, we here at Maya Muses believe that the accusation that the Jews killed Christ is a convenient way to absolve the Romans of guilt because early Christians were trying to recruit the Romans. Hey, We love Romans. We absolutely love Romans here. However, they would crucify you as soon as look at you. Why blame the Jews on this one? Anyway, just keep that in mind. You think that we invented propaganda just now, but it's as old as the written word. It's been going on forever. Now, former member Sinasta Colucci claims that 12 tribes has strict rules on everything from masturbation to toilet paper usage. Male members are supposed to masturbate and do so with a completely clear mind, not fantasizing about anything. He also alleges that toilet paper paper consumption is limited and members are told to use just a few sheets of toilet paper to completely clean themselves after a number two. They're supposed to like fold it and use it and refold it again until it's completely used up. I was with them up until this toilet paper business. Unless you have a bidet, you need a minimum of 12 sheets of toilet paper. Absolute minimum. Probably upwards of 20 sheets. This is just necessity. So I'm going to take points off for stinky bums. It is a practice at odds with the modern world. And as the world approaches polished bums, 12 tribes reaches back to the worst places of our past. And that is bad hygiene. They have strict rules for their children. The goal is to make a perfect generation. So they homeschool them so that they're not corrupted by the decadent world. 
I mean, I get it. I get it. Who doesn't get it? Seriously? The 12 tribes children apprentice at their businesses and on their farms. And some former members claim that this has kept them from getting a high school education and being able to participate in the modern world. But don't worry, many graduates of American high schools don't have an education or the skills to participate in the modern world either. For these former 12 tribes members, the grass is always greener on the other side. But for an 18 year old illiterate high school graduate with no job skills and no education, the grass might be greener over there. I will just say that their views on education are unique. <sighs> but at least they have job training, you know? <laughs> at least they leave their school knowing how to do something. A lot of our students leave school and they don't know how to do anything. So that's good. Now, it's really not uncommon to employ teens in a family business. However, media exposés such as the one by Inside Edition have led to child labor accusations and the end of lucrative contracts for them. 12 Tribes has been cleared in court, but companies don't want to do business with people with a bad reputation, with bad press. So Estee Lauder ended a contract with them because 14-year-olds were helping in the factory. Now, 12 Tribes is wrong on this one, okay? If you're going to employ 14-year-olds and not pay them, you have to call them interns. Duh. I should talk to the marketing department on this because this is just bad PR. Rookie mistake. 12 Tribes completely eschews modern Western medicine. There have been a lot of stillborns because their mothers were denied prenatal care. This woman called Rosemary Grisado left the cult in 2010. She lost her pregnancy at 38 weeks after the elders kept her from going to the hospital for the emergency C-section she needed. At 38 weeks, that kid could have survived. It's basically full term. And the elders, these elders told her that the baby died because of her sin. Current Affairs Australia is doing great work on this. Former 12 Tribes leader Hans Seneki admits that he kept women from going to the hospital. He told members to confess their sin to get the curse of illness away from them. And that if members did become seriously sick, church members would pray for them. They would use natural herbs to treat their ailments. And the members really believed that God would come through and that if he didn't, it's because of sin. This contradicts their claim in their literature, in the literature that they publish, that says that evil rules over the material world. How do you know God's not at the hospital, huh? About Hans, or Chen Zarnecki, he died in a house fire nine months after his interview. A 17-year-old affiliated with 12 tribes was charged with arson. Now, this might not have been a hit for him leaving. It could have been revenge for his evils as church elder. That's just a note. Anyway, twice a day, members are forced to take part in these gatherings. Sinasta Colucci describes it in an interview. The gathering takes place twice a day, morning and evening. It is mandatory. Everybody gathers in a circle and there are spontaneous singing and dancing. Everyone is expected to share something, which means that you have to say what you are thankful for and usually repeat something from a recent teaching. At the end of the gathering, there is a prayer, which can sometimes be awkward. You pray with your eyes open and there is no order to who speaks or when. Sometimes people would interrupt each other and say, sorry, go ahead. Sometimes they'd even say, sorry, go ahead at the same time. And that's when it really got awkward. It sometimes feels forced and is definitely not a comfortable place for an introvert like me. This sounds awful. It's really against the spirit of Roger Williams who thought it was wrong to compel people to attend church. Nevertheless, they must go to these gatherings. Overall, top points for practices. They've got many functional businesses, which is a feat in and of itself. 12 Tribes members work for a better society instead of wishing for a better society. So that's good. Now here on My Amuses, we are not passing moral judgments, okay? Points are rewarded for how effective the practices are, not how moral they are. Let's move on to charismatic leader. 12 Tribes follows Yahshua. So if you go to their website, it says, we follow Yahshua. He is our leader, Jesus Christ, the son of God. However, it is pretty obvious that Yahshua did not organize them or file their paperwork for them to get 501D status. The brains behind 12 Tribes is a man called Albert Eugene Spriggs Jr. He was born in Tennessee in 1937. He was raised in Chattanooga, where he was a football standout at Central High School. He wanted to get a psychology degree from the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. After that, he served in the Army and worked as a guidance counselor and a tour director for a travel agency. 
Can we just say that Eugene Spriggs has put his career training to good use? Some people work one job for years and they can't even excel there. Here he uses his football training, his army training, his counselor training, and his travel training to form what is a formidable cult, a formidable international cult. It's really impressive. This is the kind of competence and leadership that we need for a high-ranking cult. A Current Affair Australia also claims that Spriggs was a former carnival showman. And if that's true, it seems like another valuable skill. I mean, it's all a show, a sleight of hand to hide the illusion, sometimes from yourself. So top-notch leader. Eugene went by the Hebrew name Yannick. In 1972, he founded 12 tribes with his fourth wife, Marsha, who went by the Hebrew name Ha-Emek. It was in Chattanooga, his hometown, but when relationships with the town soured, he moved away. However, in 2005, they did return and open a yellow deli by the university he had attended. Now, according to an interview with former member Sinasta Colucci, Eugene and Marcia were at the top, and then below them were a group of apostles, and below the apostles were the community leaders for each branch. And then you had these shepherds, which were appointed to watch over each community member. Rumor from the Denver Post has it that Marsha is actually the brains behind the operation, at least towards the end. She had a series of affairs come to light in 2008, and Eugene did not divorce her, which lends weight to this rumor. However, not all of the literature is agreed on this. We remember how severely other women were allegedly punished for affairs. If Eugene was a figurehead and Marsha was the brains, it begs the question, why all the sexism? Also, will a misogynistic cult follow a female leader or do they need a male figurehead? Now, Eugene Spriggs died in 2021 at the age of 83. That was only two years ago after he had led the group for 50 years. So there might be some problems with secession. Can they find someone as competent as Eugene Spriggs? Now, Bob Pardon, who we have discussed earlier, he predicts that the group will fall apart without strong leadership. Is Bob Pardon just hating here, or will that happen? Partial credit for charismatic leader. They did have one, but he recently died. So will they be able to thrive without him? Let's move on to brainwashing techniques. 12 tribes doesn't get everyone they pitch to, but the ones that they get, they get fully. There's no half-stepping with them. Followers leave their homes and they relocate. They work on the farm or they work in the factory or in the deli. Now this is very effective because leaders control the messaging. So internet and television are discouraged. So the messages that the followers get come from 12 tribes, from the 12 tribes organization. Members change their name to Hebrew names. We mentioned how this serves to wash away the old self and create a new self within the 12 tribes community. 12 tribes deems itself capable of baptizing as they say they're made in the image of the original church. They spell this out in their text on Roger Williams. Now, 12 tribes doctrine is kept very secure by authoritarian means. Heretics are often kicked out of the community. Apostates are shunned. This speaks to the desire to not corrupt members with poisonous thoughts or poisonous people. It gets back to this messaging, controlling the messaging. Now, 12 Tribes practices love bombing, as we discussed before. However, love bombing is so standard in human interactions that I don't think it's fair to equate their love bombing with, let's say, the narcissistic love bombing we hear so much about nowadays. Unless we're all narcissists, which is possible. Members are said to work 12 to 16 hour days. Add to that the twice daily gatherings and you've got a recipe for sleep deprivation. And we know that sleep deprived people make worse choices than people who get their, let's say seven to nine hours a night. So it's very important that you never deprive yourself of sleep because you make much worse choices for your life. The practice of arranging marriages between tribe members is really interesting. It really assures that the couple's allegiance will be to the group, to the tribe, not to each other because they're not together due to love, but due to politics. However, love must still have blossomed between them because romantic and familial love is just so much stronger than cults, oftentimes. Now, the FBI report suggests that they're using hallucinogens like mushrooms and LSD. And these are great tools for programming people because it makes them open to suggestions, especially suggestions under the guise of love. Now, we discussed the FBI report before. It has not been sufficient to file charges, so take all of that with a grain of salt. 12 Tribes claims to have all the answers. It claims to possess a monopoly on love. Now, this message is attractive to young people, particularly young people who are lost and seeking. 
remember, don't go seeking anything that's not a Pokemon. And even then you gotta be kind of careful. A lot of these cult traps are set for seekers. And remember, they are more prepared for you than you are for them. So be careful when seeking. Now, 12 Tribes rightly points out that a lot of well-respected groups in history would have been called cults by today's standards. The pilgrims that founded New England would be a cult. Yeah, you got a point there. Uh, 12 Tribes also models themselves on the early church, which was considered a cult at the time. Now, to someone unstudied in cults, this is like mind-blowing information. Joining 12 Tribes is like getting on the ground floor of a movement. Who doesn't want to get in on the ground floor? Well... Remember, most startups fail, but not all of them. So who knows, 12 tribes might win out and this claim will be more than justified. It'll be more than just some fanciful sales pitch. Now, 12 tribes does not use weapons or militarization of any kind. They're waiting on the end times, not trying to cause it. The modern world is doing a great job of destroying itself. It does not need 12 tribes help. This also keeps the government off their backs. Now, I don't wanna put them down too much because they seem to have many happy followers out there. Now, communal living has its appeal, plus it's kind of got this early Christian trad thing going for it. What's not to love? Members report having found utopia. They work the land with their children and some have families with lots of children where they wouldn't have that on the outside. Modern society doesn't really allow for people to have so many children, but 12 tribes members don't have to worry about how they're gonna feed their kids. As long as they work, the children are fed. It's really just not that way in the modern world. So this is very appealing for some people. So high marks for brainwashing techniques. These are great methods. <laughs> and many 12 tribes members seem very happy. So who am I to judge? I live in Los Angeles in 2023. All of the people around me are nuts. They're freaking nuts. So the modern world has to be careful where it throws mental health bricks right now because we're living in a glass house and we're not doing so well on that front. So yeah, good for them. <laughs> quality of the followers. Overall, the quality of 12 tribes followers is very good. What is important is that they are committed to their cause and they absolutely are committed. They leave behind the modern Western world and fully commit themselves to rebuilding a new society. They work at the businesses without direct pay, profits being funneled back into the community. It is real, authentic, communal living. Followers say that they left the modern world because it is shallow and uncaring. They report that they were seeking something greater, and some seem to have found it within the 12 tribes community. So there you go. Former member Sinasta Colucci says that he joined because he was at a crossroads in his life. I'll actually read you this, what he said. I joined the 12 tribes when I was in my early 20s. I had just dropped out of college and was at a crossroads in my life. I had a lot of financial difficulties. I was a bit of a loner and I was seeking some sort of order and authority in my life. I wanted to join the military, but I was not able to because I have sickle cell anemia. I considered a homeless shelter, but was worried it wouldn't be a safe environment. The 12 tribes seemed to have exactly the right answers. They had a strong system of authority in place. It was a clean environment and they'll take in anyone off the streets. And Keep in mind, just because someone's a college dropout does not mean that they can't contribute a lot to an organization. You know, they don't need him to do advanced engineering. They just need him to work the fields or work in a cafe. Like, got you covered. Handled. Don't need a college degree. It's really the dedication that matters here, not their accomplishments in the outside world. In one video, in this one particular video that I mentioned before, a very happy member comments on the pressure of the outside world, the pressure to make it out there. So there's a huge amount of peer pressure, there's a huge amount of pressure to be someone, achieve something, be a self-made man, you know, like have it all together. And we all know that the modern world is a hustle, it's highly competitive, and it's easy to see why the communal living of 12 tribes appeals to these people. One member, he says that the worldly achievements are shallow and they left a void in his life. And I mean, if they found something fulfilling in 12 tribes, it seems good to me. You know, every person has a choice on how to spend their life. The only problem really is forcing kids into that life and not letting them choose for themselves. According to the Denver Post, many of the kids who were born into the 12 tribes have left. Looks like the constant abuse has not been effective. Who'd have thunk it? However, they are adapting their methods for the next generation. For example, it no longer allows for just anyone to beat children, only parents. Nevertheless, their methods of recruitment are effective and the outside world is getting worse by the day. It's not unbelievable that they will be able to learn from their mistakes and rebrand for a new generation. 
The one case I have mentioned before is in 2015 of the Martinez family, where three members were actually arrested for kidnapping their son who joined 12 tribes. The son is 25 years old. He was married within the church and he was expecting a child with another member. His father attended one of the services and came to the conclusion that 12 tribes was a cult. So he conspired with two other family members to kidnap the son for deprogramming. Fortunately for them, they drove away too quickly and it caught the cops' attention. Ultimately, no charges were filed, but I'm sure the family learned a very valuable lesson that day. You can only break one law at a time. So if you're doing something illegal, you have to drive safely. And if you're speeding, you can't be doing something illegal. That can be the only bad thing you're doing. Now for people at home, we all have freedom of religion. So you can't kidnap a family member. I said it before, I'm gonna say it again. You can't kidnap your family member. We actually have no say in the matter of how our family and our relatives choose to live their lives. They have to leave voluntarily. And then we can provide them with support on how to get out and rebuild their lives. It's illegal to kidnap a loved one, no matter how tempting it might seem. So top score for the followers, top points here. Imagine giving up everything you own because a deli makes a really good sandwich and will listen to you complain. Way to go, really good stuff. And that's our final criteria. So how does 12 tribes stack up? Drum roll, please. Overall, 12 tribes, formerly known as the Vine Community Church, gets four and a half goat heads out of five. This is a top tier cult. Their business acumen makes them a contender for the real world. It also gives them the resources to support their growing community. Well done. Members have unparalleled dedication. They sacrifice for the team, and that gives 12 tribes staying power. Let's see if they can find a competent leader to replace Spriggs, because that'll be the real test if they're gonna move forward into the next generation. Also, I see with the social decay of the modern world that trad movements like 12 tribes have a real appeal. 12 Tribes embraces new technologies such as YouTube and the internet for marketing, but that marketing also asks people to give up everything and live as people lived in the first century, which is not very attractive. However, if 12 Tribes is right and civilization does destroy itself, 12 Tribes will be in a much better position than the rest of us. They operate these small organic farms so they can feed themselves. This is also a benefit of the trad movements in general. Plus their face-to-face -face methods of recruiting at their delis actually work quite well. Now, I would love to give them the Christometer ranking, but Spriggs never claimed to be the Messiah. 12 tribes worships Yeshua, or Jesus, Jesus Christ. So if I did give them a Christometer ranking, it would be full marks. Really, 12 tribes made me take a second look at the original church, and someone living at that time would have called that a dangerous cult. In fact, they did. Now, would they have been wrong? That is beyond the scope of this video. Subscribe.